You're listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. With me this week are Jeff Ranke and Anna Wells. We each have more than 15 years of experience covering the manufacturing industry. Every week, we take the five most popular stories and discuss the implications they might have on the industry going forward. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, Anna, or David at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. We're also live every Friday, so make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube at IEN Magazine to get a notification and join us, comment, join the party. Uh, Anna, how are you doing this week? Great. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, uh, Jeff, according to Anna, I'm louder in the morning. Oh, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no debate to this. Yeah, yeah it's either yeah. he's louder or I haven't had enough coffee or a combination of those two things. I'm not sure. Yeah, you're, you're much louder and I am leaning <laughs> heavily on the coffee. It's been some kind of late nights this week nice. with volleyball and oh, softball. Good uh, reasons, good yeah. stuff, but just like, <laughs> so. Well, I don't apologize. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before we get started, we have a word from our new sponsor, Red Zone. Manufacturers are facing extraordinary challenges today with labor shortages, supply chain disruptions, and a changing workforce. Complex industrial technology doesn't cut it on the front line. What's needed is a new way of working that will not only meet throughput goals, but change the shop floor culture to one of winning, where every worker feels they play a part in achieving the company's goals for success. What's needed is Red Zone, the connected workforce solution. And we're back. Did you guys have a chance to check out that new pre-roll? Yeah, it was awesome. I really like it. Jeff, I really need to know what a Kodiak cake flapjack power cup is. Now you know. No, I don't. I mean, I only know that that's the word. It's just like I need to order them and they need to be a part of my life. Um, so Red Zone has big clients, particularly in food and beverage and the consumer packaged goods industry. Uh, Red Zone, empower the front line, grow the bottom line. Also, Thanks for joining the Today in Manufacturing podcast. Awesome. Uh, yeah. All right. Our first story this week. Nissan to pull the plug on pioneering EV. As the strong winds of change blow through the EV industry. <laughs> oh, my God. The leaf has fallen. The drama. Automotive News reports that Nissan will discontinue the groundbreaking leaf after more than a decade. The leaf was ahead of its time. It came out in 2010 as an electric vehicle aimed at the average car buyer. It was the world's top-selling EV for a while. Still, less than 175,000 Leafs have been sold to date. Tesla Model 3 has torched the Leaf in recent years, and other automakers are now in the game. As the Leaf turns into mulch, Nissan plans to introduce 15 battery electric models by the beginning of 2030. Anna. All told, the public wasn't interested in an EV that could go less than 75 miles on a charge. Right. Um, <clears throat> and uh, my analysis of this is going to be far, there's going to be far fewer puns in it. So I apologize to everyone in advance. That well, was maybe. a nice NFL Films voice you started out <laughs> with, though. That was impressive. <laughs> I had some fun with that one. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, as you said, uh, the leaf was ahead of its time, which to me means like this was not that much of a surprise. Mm. I mean, look, the only reason the Prius is still around is because there's nothing that Toyota has created to replace it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that anybody likes the way it looks. I, it's just it's fine. But I think like leaf, the Chevy Volt, like they kind of have the same story. Um, they were pioneering for where. They started, but now they need to make room for new technology and more exciting designs. Mm -hmm. And even as they develop better batteries at these companies and the like, I don't think it serves Nissan well to invest in a full redesign of a vehicle that's brand is associated with old EV tech, short range, stuff like that. The, the body style is not very cool. No. Um, <clears throat> and GM had a similar story with the Volt where it's lower range and internal combustion engine backup was really just old tech mm -hmm. and GM at the time. And this was in 2019 um, said that they were making bigger commitments and that they wanted to focus on the new and emerging technologies that they were spending big money on. So they killed the Volt 
Yeah. Then, you know, so not to mention GM said that they were focusing more on electric SUVs and trucks, which is consistent with consumer demand. And of course, Nissan will do this, too, um, as their truck and SUV sales tend to be about double that of their cars. So I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I think we'll see this with really m- most, if not all of everyone's sort of pioneer design that mm-hmm. they will because it doesn't make sense as i said before to to keep this around and apply all the new tech to it the brand is you know what it is they're better off just coming up with an entirely new model yeah uh jeff no love lost for the leaf huh a little nostalgic though i can mm-hmm. i was actually at the consumer <clears throat> electronics show 2011 2012 i got to drive a leaf and mm-hmm. it was relatively new out there and and stuff and it felt essentially like a bigger golf cart <laughs> oh, being okay. honest like it handled well it drove well but it was kind of a point a to point b type of vehicle and one of the things that I like to say on this podcast a lot is you're waiting for the thing that's going to lead to the mm-hmm. thing uh-huh. and they had the thing it just didn't lead to anything better and bigger with yeah. the Leaf. They had a good start. And really, it's still a pretty economical option. When you look at an EV for about twenty eight grand, and the, the 2023 will have over 200 miles of range per charge. Mm-hmm. But it just doesn't stand out. Like mm-hmm. you said, from uh, an aesthetics perspective, from a performance perspective, it's just not unique. It, yeah. it, it cannot keep pace. And I think Nissan really missed out here. I've actually bought a couple of Nissan vehicles in the last five years. My daughter drives an Ultima. I have a Maxima. They're great cars. Mm-hmm. They, they handle well. They're fuel efficient. Why they wouldn't have tried to transition some of those models, like the Sentra is also another Nissan that sells yeah. very, very well. Why they wouldn't have taken some of those brands and tried to offer an EV option as sort of building off of the Leaf is where I think they really missed out. Well, maybe they ha- are planning that, you know? I mean, well, well the next the, one is the Altria. Right? Yeah, and it's, that's kind of disappointing because mm-hmm. you're going from a, a sedan, a small vehicle in less than $30,000 to a CUV that's almost 50. Yeah. And there's a ton of competition in that market already. Mm-hmm. So I, I appreciate what, if they're going to do that with some of these more popular models down the road, great. But you had this like five year head start, right? <laughs> Why didn't you do it sooner? Because yeah. It could, this could have been the thing that led to the thing, and I think they just really missed out. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe they just missed out on, uh, you know, they didn't see the whole crossover revolution coming. Well, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> part well, of the deal. Yeah, uh, so Nissan reported a significant decrease in vehicle sales during the first quarter of 2022. What's interesting, though, is that the Leaf is still doing relatively well in sales because sales increased over 49% year over year to 4,371, which is about the 10 year average for the model is around 4,000 per quarter. And I mean, it accounts for about 5.8% of Nissan's passenger car sales and only 2.3% of total volume. But to me, it looks like they're killing the leaf because the federal tax credit is running out. So for the each manufacturer has a separate expiration date that comes when the automaker has sold 200,000 qualified vehicles. By the time the Leaf is done being sold, they're going to reach about 190. It's going to get to about 189,000. So, I wonder if it's less about the Leaf failing or just being put out to pasture, being turned into mulch, if you will, or, you know, just basically rebranding it as the Altria you know, to maybe tap into, I mean, those federal That's tax credits vehicle, for like 7,500. Yeah, the, the tax credit is definitely going to be part of it, I think, yeah. when people are looking at their different options, if that's not there versus a vehicle that still has that yeah. available to but it. But it's total, it's total fleet. So mm-hmm. it's not like they run out on the Leaf, but they can use it on other models. Oh, it's just gotcha. total yeah, EV thought, sales. Okay. So gotcha, I, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. But I mean, I was going to say too, like the Leaf, it peaked in 2014. Sales are half of what they were then. So I think it has become just less interesting because it's not a performance vehicle. And now mm-hmm. when you've got Tesla and you've got other options out there that are just sexier and more fun, and this is just your basic sort of grocery getter, yeah. Yeah, it just can't compete. All right, all right. Our next most popular story, Chinese-made GPS tracker, highly vulnerable. An automotive GPS tracker made in China has severe software vulnerabilities. Used in nearly 170 countries, Boston cybersecurity firm BitSight says this tracker poses a risk to highway safety, national security, and supply chains. Flaws in the tracker could let attackers remotely hijack device-equipped vehicles cutting off fuel 
or even seizing control of the vehicle. The researchers say users should immediately disable the MV720 GPS tracker until a fix becomes available. BitSight has been trying to contact Shenzhen-based manufacturer MyCotus since September to get them to address the problems. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is aware of, quote, any active, exp- is not aware of any active exploitation of the vulnerabilities yet. The manufacturer, MyCotus, says 1.5 million devices are installed across 420,000 customers, including major energy and aerospace companies, national militaries, and a nuclear power plant operator, mostly in Brazil, Mexico, Spain, and Russia. Anna, I thought this was a particularly interesting story about a seemingly cheap, inexpensive, those are the same words, components, being in so many mission-critical industries and people just not realizing that it was vulnerable. Yeah, and obviously this is happening a lot. Um, And the word vulnerable is so kind of gray and vague that it's like, oh, vulnerable, what's the worst that could happen? And then... (laughs) Yeah. Like someone can remotely hijack your car. Okay, cool. Yeah, like that's, that's bad. terrifying. Yeah. Um, to me, this story like couldn't be a better commercial for USA Made if you tried. I mean, it's situations like these where this product is abundant in the market in multiple countries. The regulators are trying to work with them and they literally can't get a hold of the company. I mean, you hear this in other industries where companies say stuff like, oh, if I ever have a problem, I like to know that I can show up on their front step and figure it out. Like Mm -hmm. in this case, no one is responding and those who are, aren't able to communicate in English. So, you know, we get annoyed by like product recalls and the like, but imagine if you had absolutely no recourse. Like I know it's a $25 product, but still like you see, like I think a lot of people who have this may, may see this and just stop using the product. There's no, you know, they're not like returning it. They can't do Mm -hmm. that, you know? (laughs) So that, you know, it's it's difficult for the consumers who really are, are being exploited in the situation. And then meanwhile, this media blitz, I think, is just like <laughs> giving all these like details to potential nefarious actors of like how they can ex- exploit the system, which I don't know if that's helpful either. I know that you need to like let the public know about this. But at the same time, you're also being like, hey, um, hey, hackers. Yeah. You know what? We have a challenge for you. Yeah. You know what you can do with this? Mm -hmm. It's actually really easy to get in there (laughs) and just start carjacking remotely. It's very easy. So, Well, it's easy to hijack the component. But Jeff, I was wondering how easy it is to turn it off. You know, it's I mean, uh, it doesn't it seems like an embedded component. It's not like you can just pull the hood up and, you know, (laughs) <laughs> Flip it to off. Well, yes and no. Okay. I mean, it, because it's a GPS tracker, it's not like it's vital to the functionality of a vehicle. Okay. Mm-hmm. So to remove it probably would not be difficult. The problem is the way it's connected and the, what it's connected to. Mm-hmm. So, and the one thing too that, that I think is worth um, just kind of clarifying Medicus has all of these features right on their site in terms of what this thing is capable of doing. And it is sort of a. <laughs> It's set up to track and also potentially be a security device. In other words, part of the functionality of it is you can shut this off in case somebody is trying to track your vehicle to try Mm. to steal it. If they do want to steal it, you can actually do something, I think, to like actually cause the engine to seize up so the the vehicle essentially becomes bricked. So all of these things are very transparent. And quite honestly, if um, what's the company's name that found out about it? Um, Bit. Oh, it's uh, BitSight. BitSight. I guarantee you anybody who's interested in hacking this already knew it. Okay? Oh, okay. These companies, that's one of the things that's so you have to balance sort of being absolutely terrified by what is available from these nefarious actors and also educating people as to what is what they are capable of doing. Mm-hmm. Because when I look at this and what it's intended for, it looks like it's really intended for fleets, vehicle fleets yeah. in a lot of these very important industries for tracking information. Obviously it's a GPS device. So with that being the case, the most susceptible the the entity that it's most susceptible or the type of attack it's probably most susceptible to is ransomware. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> because yeah. if you are working for a military, defense, energy, aerospace, you've got money. And what there's with these ransomware as a group type of hackers are going to do is they're not interested in breaking that vehicle. They're interested in attacking the server, getting that information and holding it hostage. That's mm-hmm. what they're going to do. And I think there's this 
persona of these ransomware groups that it's somebody sitting down in their mom's basement basically typing away. These are extremely complex and well-organized entities. This is no longer the renegade guy out there just doing something to be a jerk. Mm -hmm. These are companies that have a goal. They have budgets. They recruit. They are set up just like any other type of company. So when they're that complex, they already know about these vulnerabilities and they're going to try to exploit them to the as much as they possibly can. So it, it becomes a bigger security issue. And another thing that companies need to look at when they're specifying these components, where they're coming from, and what they can do in response to these types of potential attacks. Uh, this is this company here, I know I'm kind of going on, but this company Upstream released a report and they're saying that since 2018, there is an increase of more than 225% of automotive hacks Oh well, people targeting the cyber criminals targeting owners of these vehicles, crazy, mm -hmm. and the number of connected devices is going to shoot up by like two hundred percent in the next five years. So we're going to have over seven hundred million connected vehicles on the road with a lot of these types of devices in them. And whenever you look at anything that has infotainment or some sort of connectivity, connected device or capability, that's something that they're not going to go after that vehicle. They're going to go after the server it's connected to to get into the vehicle and get out your information. Mm -hmm. And that's what's frightening. No, the ransomware uh, aspect of this was what I found particularly concerning as well. Um, uh, regular live listener, Seth, uh, Jeff, to your point, agrees. <laughs> he says, hackers gonna hack. They're gonna find a way. For mm -hmm. sure, Seth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, just in terms of the more and doom, gloom, doom and gloom aspect of this, you know, first responders vehicles could be crippled. You know, uh, as you said, hackers could shut off the engine and demand ransomware in some sort of cryptocurrency. And the entire I logistical challenge behind that just frightens me. Well, and here's the thing, and I'm going to plug, we talk about Security Breach, the yeah. program that we have going on. This next week, we're going to come out. We talked with Satnam Narang. He is from Tenable. They put out a paper talking about how complex these organizations are put together to the point where they actually outsource somebody who finds out how to get access Mm -hmm. to someplace that they want to breach. Mm -hmm. They hire somebody else to actually plant or take care of the actual um, shutdown, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then another person internally that specializes in negotiating the ransom. Ugh. All of these organizations are so complex. It is, it is frightening and impressive. I'd encourage you to watch this episode because Satnam also talks about ways you can combat these folks. Yeah. I mean, it's not hopeless. Yeah, no, there, it's, are, there are a lot of things out there that we can do, and some of them aren't that complicated. It offers solutions, not just, you know, fear. <laughs> yeah, just right. like, and there's nothing yeah. you can do about it. There, so. are, there are good guys out there, too. Not everybody is a black hat. Um, Richard Clark, the former U.S. cybersecurity czar, called the insecure GPS device yet another example of a smart Chinese-made product that, quote, is phoning home and could be used maliciously by the Chinese government. Now, Clark said that he doubted the tracker was designed for that purpose, but he said the danger is real because Chinese companies are obliged by law to follow their government's orders. And uh, was that something that you thought about the Chinese connection there too? It can it certainly could be. Yeah. Um, typically, I think there's more there's more benefit to the individual organization. These ransomware organizations typically have no political affiliation. All they want is what's best for them. Yeah. So while it's Which certainly, yeah. Yeah. But Jeff, are, like based on what you said before, do you think that it's possible that these GPS devices that were produced in China, actual tracking devices are being used by fleets in defense, the defense industry? I mean, that's what it sounds like. That's who some of the people that they're selling them to. Now it's, it's not here in the U S no, it was like, but South if you're Africa. looking for okay, some, of these, yep. some yep. of these smaller um, countries that mm -hmm. don't have the defense budget that we do that maybe aren't vetting them as much as they should because this is still, believe it or not, sort of a nuanced development in terms of people really understanding how easy it is to get in. Yeah. Because again, you can't hack the vehicle with this. They're going the other way. And that was another thing Upstream pointed out. Almost half of these automotive hacks, they're not going for the vehicle. They're entering through the network. Mm -hmm. And that's how they're getting to the vehicle. So it's... It's insane. Yeah, the only specifics were it was uh, national military in South America, uh, my mistake, and then in Eastern Europe. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Our next most popular story this week. Amy's Kitchen to Close 11-Month-Old Plant. California-based Amy's Kitchen was first established in 1987 and has since expanded to reach more than 30 countries, producing a million meals per day using organic 
and non-GMO ingredients. However, founders Rachel and Andy Berliner have had some problems. Working conditions at factories have taken heat as workers have claimed that line speeds are too fast for bathroom breaks and that injured workers are routinely fired. This week, we learned that Amy's will be closing its San Jose frozen foods plant and saying goodbye to 300 workers. The plant was opened just 11 months ago to make frozen pizzas, but inflation has caused massive cost spikes and supply chain problems are delaying critical equipment. The problems have reported <clears throat> the problems have reportedly been costing Amy's a million dollars a month. The company is also facing turnover and worker shortages. Some say Amy's grew too fast to supply a surging COVID-induced demand, and others say boycotts and claims over working conditions have had a tangible impact. Jeff, what was it? <laughs> Decide. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think Anna's going to talk a little bit more about the organic food industry and, and some of the maybe the, the challenges there. But I mean, this this sector just took off between 2018 and 2020. So a huge grew, growth that cooled a lot than over the last 12 months or so. But I think some of the bigger issues here with Amy's is you, you touched on all of the issues they were having with their labor, their workforce before. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that caused these employees to then look at unions. And I think whenever you start throwing around words like Teamsters, getting involved in your facility, that makes people nervous from the management perspective. Uh, if they're going to start collaborating that way, um, because that's going to look at probably driving up a lot of your costs for the, for the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's tough when you've got a brand new facility that's facing market challenges, new types of demand, supply and demand elements that are coming into play. Also, you've got a workforce in which the competition is so much greater now. It's different. It's changed just in the last 18 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. When you look at, first of all, the how much you're going to pay, okay? And that leads into the whole competitive element. The, they were probably forecasting paying workers somewhere around 12 to 15 bucks an hour. Well, that's not competitive anymore. Mm -hmm. And then it's a food product and that eats into your margins and you're selling $12 frozen pizzas. That is tough, especially when you've got this multi-million dollar facility that you're trying to ramp up. I think the first whiff of difficulty that they started having, understanding all these potential issues that were looming from a workforce perspective, coupled with the market sector challenges, mm -hmm. I, I think they had no other options. And I think, I'm not saying they took the easy way out, but I think it was probably very clear yeah. what they needed to do well, here. And not exactly in a, I don't want to say cost effective, but cheap location. I feel like San Jose is might be a difficult spot, you yeah. know, in terms of costs for like sure, uh, labor and operations. Uh, Anna, I know that you've been following this Amy's Kitchen story for a long time. Um, what was your thought on the latest developments about this, you know, plant that's not even a year old mm -hmm. shutting its doors? Yeah, I mean, it's really just an incredible story, and I think as Jeff was kind of alluding to really the perfect storm of conditions yeah. that hit Amy's um, as they tried to ramp up this new plant. Um, they've been inundated with criticism. David, you mentioned some of the allegations that have taken place on behalf of the employees. There was a lot of public outcry and scrutiny over this, and I wholeheartedly believe that they lost customers over it. I do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously they were dropped by some grocers, some, some uh, retailers. Um, I think it was very publicized, highly publicized. So people knew about it, right? Well, and you're a customer and it made you think twice about it. Right, for sure. And, um, you know, I think what I want to focus on more, um, because there are so many elements, but one that really struck me in this was just the idea that Amy's overexpanded to meet market conditions that turned out to be temporary. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, you mentioned the organic um, food industry. Um, you know, I think that's one element, but also um, I think Amy's looked at the pandemic business conditions where people were buying a lot more ready to eat yeah. um, or frozen items um, and thought that they needed to jump on that. And I understand why. I mean, we see this a lot, right? But it sort of came back to bite them. There were, you know, when you look at the pandemic, how many things that were overproduced um, <laughs> in response to that hand sanitizer comes to mind <laughs> for yeah. one. Yeah. But I think about cultural trends like home gyms, like Peloton, you know, bet super big on continued expansion before getting absolutely crushed by like plateauing mm -hmm. subscriber rates, reduced interest in their machines as society began to reopen and people went back to the gym. Now, Peloton had a whole host of other problems. That's clear. Right. But 
Um, I think it speaks to this sort of strategic understanding that companies need to bring to the table when assessing the viability of an expansion. Um, And we see this a lot when we look at like, you know, a company spends two billion dollars on some facility or whatever, you know, um, and then within a couple of years, the market shifts and they just abandon or they walk away. Uh, You know, I I think I think it's interesting as we heard the term new normal kicked around so much uh, during the pandemic and. In the end, I think that the permanent changes were fewer than we expected. Um, You know, you can probably think of many things just off the top of your head that you were buying regularly during the pandemic uh, that you're not buying now. Like, you know, for us, it was like coffee, dry goods. Like we weren't going to restaurants, Mm -hmm. entertainment for our kids, streaming services, disposable masks, Clorox wipes, like all that stuff. Like you could think of like, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, two hands, all, all the things that you... So saw a precipitous drop in your budget of like how much you were spending on those products once the world started to reopen. And I think some of these companies got a little bit overzealous um, when they were looking at the potential for them yeah. to sustain that growth. And I think it was in many cases uh, temporary, unfortunately, for Amy's. Well, overzealous and also not really not knowing how long it was going to take. You know, it, right. I mean, no one could have predicted that. America is pretty much going to say, we're going to give it a good two years. And then the new normal is going back. And then people just, are going to just, yeah, just for, like, forget you know, this ever happened. Yeah, I guess. Nah. No, it's, uh, I mean, I understand because whenever I heard somebody be like, Haha, new normal, am I right? I'm like, yeah, but not really. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to force it back. <laughs> yeah, there's like more work from home. I, I think that that it was something that kind of stuck. But you still for see for for now, you yeah. still see a lot of companies kind of like trying to cheat that back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in a year, I'm curious to see where we're at with that even. Yeah. But that was like one of the only things that I could think of that I was like, OK, well, that that has changed yeah. um, for, for some industries that are like, OK, we don't care if you're remote now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But I there's mean, a lot of things that just went right back to normal. The one thing is that like the people that installed the hand sanitizer everywhere. Mm-hmm. Those are still there. And I still find those nice. Like I still find it nice that I can go to a public park and there's like hand sanitizer there. That's true. Because there's never been a place that needs it more. <laughs> it's like, just coat this place. Just put a you sanitizer just mist on it. Put your kid underneath it and like shower. Yeah. Just hit it 10 yeah. times in a row. Yeah. Um. So it came out that operations are going to cease, quote, sometime in September. And I thought that, you know, because it wasn't as certain that's got to be difficult for some of those workers. Just like, uh, maybe we'll be here till October. Maybe not. Just like, is it the beginning of the month? You know? Right. Um, and then Fred Scarpala or Scarpola, the acting CEO and chief culinary officer said he was quote, very sad. Yep. Yeah. He did say a little more than that, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he just tweeted. It was just like, <laughs> very sad. Yeah. I, uh, sad face emoji. I read, I read, well, that was the first quote that they had. I'm like, well, good, Fred. You're a human. That's good that you feel real feelings. Um, I would say that a lot of people were heated up about this Amy's Kitchen issue, though. And of our videos that we have on multiple platforms, these stories are the some of the ones that are commented on the most frequently from both sides. Like uh, two of the comments that I pulled out, one was from a person that said, I currently work at Amy's Kitchen San Jose plant, and all of this is true and more. Discrimination, retaliation, intimidating employees, and favoritism all going on at the same time. No appreciation for all our hard work. And another person that said, I actually personally know a longtime employee and literally all this is true. So I don't know if those two just know each other. Wow. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but there were also there were also uh, comments on the other side that say none of this is true. This is all just, you know, uh, attempts to unionize stuff like that. Mm. Um, but it was just I found it. I was surprised because until some of the stories came out and started raising the issue, I had no idea. I knew about greater problems in food processing. Yeah. Right. But uh, the fact that it targeted Amy's Kitchen, do you think that people were so fired up because of sort of the. Uh, the business plan behind Amy's Kitchen, the fact that it's organic, non-GMO, do you think that workers were hoping to maybe be in a I don't know. A better environment. I think that they pride themselves on taking uh, taking on s- social justice issues, mm-hmm. um, and so yes, I think that that hits back harder than if people feel like you're exploiting your employees and you're presenting yourself in such a way that suggests that you would do the opposite. Right. Then people, I think, are more offended by that yeah. than if it's just like Tyson. 
not. <laughs> or like a, a meat processing you, facility. Yes, I think yeah, we're, yeah. yeah, we understand each other. Yeah, I think this company, I mean, we talked about this when we talked initially a couple, I don't know, months ago about some of those initial labor issues, how this company just grew so fast. Mm-hmm. And it's apparent they didn't handle that growth very well. Yeah. Right? Our next most popular story this week, Ford to cut 8,000 jobs. Reportedly. Reportedly. A Bloomberg report says that Ford may be making some huge job cuts, reportedly. (laughs) The company plans to reduce headcount by 8,000 over the next few weeks. The cuts will likely target the internal combustion engine side of the business. Ford currently employs around 31,000 salaried workers, most in the U.S. This spring, Ford CEO Jim Farley unveiled a plan to cut $3 billion in costs. Earlier this, earlier this year, Farley said Ford has, quote, too many people. Well, now they're going to have about 25% less. Jeff, when Ford split the company into Ford Blue and Model E, we kind of thought this could happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's about that, though, in this instance. I don't think it's really about the electrics versus the com- internal combustion vehicles. I think this is more, and it's something we've talked about a ton here in the automotive landscape. It's just shifted dramatically. Now, it's it's oddly difficult to find real reliable numbers in terms of how many vehicles have been produced annually mm. versus how many have been sold. You see a lot of different sales numbers. You see different production numbers. It's, it's hard to get a handle on it. But we know for a fact they're producing less, they're mm. selling less, but they're selling more. And they're being, they're more profitable. The margins on all of these vehicles are better right yeah, now. Selling four more. So when you're looking potentially at ways to right size your company and be, continue on with this mar- these profit margins, if you don't need to make as many vehicles to make the level of, of money that you, are, that you want, you don't need as many people. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I, I can understand where they're coming from and potentially looking to right size, if you will, their company. I think it just is a, something that we're going to see throughout automotive. I don't think it's going to be the extent of 8,000. That seems really high. Like, I, I don't know that about that number. Again, these is sort of rumored right now. We don't mm-hmm. know exactly what they're looking to do, but it can't be surprising again when you're looking at what the automakers have found out for years, they've always struggled with understanding how many do we produce and how much we're going to sell. I mean, we used to see all the time, you know, year end model closeout sales, right? Yeah. That's not a thing. And mm-hmm. I think the the automakers are pretty happy that's not a thing, that yeah. they can produce the right amount and match it up with what's being sold. So again, I think this is all part of this, just this dramatic shift. I mean, obviously the, the chip situation is part of that. I think they want to get to a little bit looser situation. They don't like inventory this tight. Mm -hmm. But again, I think this is just in response to all those changes. But it has to, I mean, the EV versus uh, internal combustion engine has to play a part of that because when they split the company, you know, it's just understood that the Model E side of the business is going to be more automated. You know, EVs just in general take less of a headcount to produce. If, If this was three or four years from now, maybe I would agree with that. I don't agree with that right now. Okay. Well, I do, David. All right. Thank you very much for agreeing. Also, I like how Jeff countered this rumor by saying he doesn't like rumors and then started his own rumor. Where he was just like, no, where you're like, this 8,000 seems high. No. (laughs) So it's just the opposite rumor. Also, my opinion is a rumor? No. Quit starting rumors, Jeff. Man, you're such a gossip. (laughs) (laughs) David, what are you covering up with the, uh, the black shirt all the time? You don't want to know these scars. They're mostly emotional. Uh, Anna, so you were saying you agree with me? (laughs) (laughs) I do think that, like, you know, if these reports are to be believed, uh, these sources are saying that Ford is actively siphoning money, basically, from the internal combustion division to fund the EV division. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you can say that this is not about those two divisions. I mean, you can say it, but you could be wrong. Like Um, you were last week when you were talking about the, the heated seat situation. Oh, not even. Not even. Let's, I have yet to hear anyone agree with you on that. Yeah. So. The only person that agrees. dozens. Find me those. Dozens. Oh, <laughs> send those They're dozens my way. Spreading rumors again. How the hundreds of people that mailed in to agree with Jeff. <laughs> the only person that agreed with you was when you like responded to the reader agreeing with yourself. No, I didn't. What? Yeah, it happened. You talked way through that one, man. I know. I know. So, guys. <laughs> Uh, this So this is a developing story, and it's possible that more is revealed about this, even by the time some of you are listening to this podcast. But at least for now, mm-hmm. Ford is calling Bloomberg's report 
speculative, which is not exactly a vehement denial. Right. I think if this were not happening, that they would maybe have quashed this much earlier and much more precisely. Yeah. But um, to me, it looks like Ford is going for broke on this EV thing, and they might have to. Um, We know that EVs are going to create a tipping point, but at at least for a while, um, and we're there now, it's going to be very costly with not a huge return. So when it scales, I think this money comes back. But Ford believes and Ford believes that EVs can be profitable. They've said that, right? We know that they can be. But it's going to be hard to keep shareholders happy when you plan to give them a few more years of heavy investment and little return. Jim Farley knows this. And I think he's probably more than likely already facing immense pressure to cut costs because there are very few automakers who are going to manage this transition with just their status quo operation. Um, it's possible, in my opinion, that the Mustang Mach-E, which was very well received, was a bit of a litmus test for Ford. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what emboldened the company leaders to take this aggressive step, um, if they are taking the step. Um, So as for his comments earlier this year that Ford has too many people, I don't really know how that's assessed. That brought to mind um, Office Space, that scene where they have those two guys in the meeting and they're like, what is it you think you do around here? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they're cutting... I don't know, product designers in ICE division. If if they think that this stuff is going away, um, then maybe that's them starting early. I don't know. Well, and you talked about the Mach-E. And Mm -hmm. uh, I was also, Jeff, thinking about the F-150 Lightning. Yeah. I mean, with these kind of cuts, those better be a hit, right? Well, they better. And that's why I think it certainly is part of it. I just don't think that's the driving force behind it because you still – you have to get to the future. You still have to preserve the right now. <laughs> and, you know, 98% of your sales still come from internal combustion engine vehicles. So you have to be careful there. And that's why I think this is just more about adjusting to a lot of these changes. EV is part of that changing landscape. I'm not saying it, it, it oh, isn't, yeah. but I think it's also the supply and demand, how that has shifted so dramatically. I think that's a bigger part of it. Okay. Well, Going to keep it on automotive with our (laughs) most popular story this week. And it's always, every time this report comes out, it's always the most popular for the week. The most stolen cars of 2021. Nearly 1 million vehicles were stolen in 2021. Historically high used car prices have thieves salivating. The National Insurance Crime Bureau's annual Hot Wheels report came out this week. And full-size pickup trucks from Ford and Chevy were the most stolen last year, with nearly 100,000 combined reports. Chevy edged Ford by just 207 vehicles. The most common model was actually the 2004 for Chevy and the 2006 for Ford. The Honda Civic and Accord rounded out the rest of the top four, with more than 60,000 reported stolen in 2021. The Civic took third by a margin of about 1,400, and the Honda was the oldest car stolen, with an average of the uh, top stolen Honda was the 1997. I feel like that's been on this list since 1997. What did they do with that one? The list saw a steep drop from four to five, with more than 17,000 Toyota Camrys stolen. Now, and a passenger vehicle thefts increased 8% in 2021 compared to 2020, and I think that's just, an, you know, it's indicative of the current climate. Yeah, I mean, it's very, uh, you know, used car prices are at the highest they've been. Um, I think I read that they were up something like 40% uh, in purchase price for a used car versus pre-pandemic, mm. which is crazy. <laughs> um, and I just feel like it's unfair because you can't even like have that one feather in your cap of like having a beater car and being like, at least no one's going to steal it. <laughs> right. Like there's nothing flashy about these. I, I know that like those trucks are expensive, right? Mm-hmm. But like the Hondas, yeah. like the old Hondas, like there's nothing flashy about those vehicles. But, you know, we've seen this in our own community as well. And so I think it's more than just like the vehicle resale price, resale but um, like there's been a rash of thefts uh, around here for um, the Toyota Prius for their catalytic converters. Mm-hmm. So thieves were either taking the whole vehicle um, to mine for that part or they would just um, pull it out and leave the car. Yeah. Right on the you street. You know, 
Now it's specifically Jeez. in our area, Hyundais and Kias, which local officials are saying those are being targeted by thieves because of a design flaw that makes them easier to steal. Mm -hmm. And these are like two, 2011 to 2015 model years. So again, older vehicles. And, and in the case of Kia, they said that they were aware of the rise in vehicle thefts of certain trim levels of vehicles. And as of the current 2022 model year, all Kia vehicles have an engine immobilizer fitted as standard. Cool, but very unhelpful. Mm -hmm. If you <laughs> like in, inadvertently bought a more stealable vehicle um, and, you know, like it, it just it sucks because like the insane price makes of resale makes every vehicle more vulnerable, but clearly some more than others. And as you mentioned, that 1997 Honda. Yeah. What? I mean, there's something about that vehicle that is making it a target, right? Yeah. That just makes it easy. And it's just so unfortunate that you can unwittingly find yourself with a vehicle that's just an easier grab and there's not a lot that you can do about it. It's not like automakers are scrambling to issue a recall on these cars and how yeah, they're just like a little heads up. That's all. Yeah. I mean, but how could they, you know, it wouldn't mm -hmm. even really be reasonable to do that. Um, they send everyone a club. I think so. I mean, you send everyone a club and then you just apologize and just say and, and when when they say stuff like very unhelpful stuff like park your vehicle inside, like if you're parking it outside, yeah. you don't have a place to park it inside. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's it's not like people are just like by choice. Like uh, I like to put it under the hail when it hails. I just prefer it. <laughs> well, maybe they're, you know, a family with three to four cars in mom and dad's car. got to have to get out of there because the uh, Hyundai or Kia parked on the street maybe no it's uh i was surprised by how much that messaging has blanketed my neighborhood as well mm -hmm. it's just like if you have these cars get them inside because the thefts are so off the charts right now. it's crazy uh jeff what were your thoughts on the hot wheels report well i think you've seen some of these older vehicles being targeted because they have fewer connected security devices on them so they're easier to steal mm -hmm. i mean it makes sense as far as that older um honda i think that's maybe a target for a lot of the tuner audience i think they they go towards those vehicles because of the size and what they can do to them mm -hmm. there's still enough room to actually customize them whereas the newer vehicles much more difficult more expensive to do that too so okay. it, it does kind of make sense when you see some of these the one that kind of tripped me up was the nissan ultima yeah. that's the only one on this list that's not in like the top 25 vehicles sold i mean these other ones are obviously very popular the more that are out there yeah. the more are going to be just sold makes sense. so it's just it's, it's kind of very dependable jeff so you know if you're looking for something to steal hey, my daughter that's what she drives yeah. she has an ultima i mean i get it but it was just surprising in context with the others i guess but um the thing that i think it's gonna be interesting going forward again i think there's two factors we've already talked a lot about the cybersecurity elements here and what role that's going to play because i think as vehicle, they're just so much easier to track now. They all have some sort of embedded GPS on them. You can find them at some point. Right. It's not just filing off a VIN number and <laughs> trying to to go from there. So I think you're going to see. It'll be interesting to see how that plays because that could go both ways. We've seen how it can be a preventive measure, but that also can help somebody who's sophisticated enough to hack and get into the vehicle that way. Right. So we'll see what happens there. The other thing that I think that will play a part too is what when we finally see the used car market come back into balance. Potentially, that could be a number, another year or so is what they're kind of forecasting. They feel okay. things have stabilized a little bit. But I mean, at the end of the day, you know, to borrow a quote from Seth, our faithful viewer, mm -hmm. thieves be thieving. Yeah. So thieves are going to thieve, Jeff. Yeah. No. Uh, what was the story? Was it a Ford lot that they were stealing them right off the lot? Because it wasn't that because of a security uh, a vulnerability in the new uh I don't Software. think they had the chips in yet. Oh, okay. So I think that's okay. why that's made happened them to multiple automaker lots in Detroit. Stellantis, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, so the Jeep Cherokee and, and Grand Cherokee sport utility uh, vehicle made its first appearance on the Hot Wheels top ten list. Um, actually, the Dodge full size pickup dropped, dropped off this year. So Dodge, whatever you're doing, it's working. Um, and Ford was actually number one last year. And Chevy, like I said, took that crown by just 207 <laughs> just vehicles. Just a hair. Yeah. But it's so crazy when you're looking at those numbers. Like, it's like 48,000 to 47,000 and change. It's just weird how they line up so closely in yeah. terms of what are stolen. Um, it also was interesting to see that pickup thefts increased significantly year over year. Everything else was down significantly or flat. So it's clear that, you know, if you have a pickup, maybe take some, you know, extra security measures. I mean, yeah. just in general, every year this comes out and it's like, make sure you lock your doors. Mm -hmm. I can't believe how many people still don't lock their doors. You know um, what, though? Sometimes people don't because 
they get their window smashed and someone takes their change. Yeah. And it's like, you know what I mean? They just figure it's harder to steal their car yeah. than it is to, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's how they combat that. Cause I've, I know people that's happened to, and they just don't lock their doors. That anymore. was, that was me. That was my old truck that I used to have. Yeah. Uh, I never locked the doors and they still smashed the window when they <laughs> took everything out of it. I'm like, Rude. so I put a sign that just said the doors are open. Like, uh, because you put it up wasn't a sign. Even, well, it wasn't even like, it was a old truck that I bought off my stepbrother and uh, oh, I remember the old truck. Yeah, with the with the red door. It's like clearly this is not the factory door. Maybe just try it. <laughs> and uh, they just blasted the window. Open. What did they think was inside there? They took my CD player with like a crowbar because you could see the crowbar mark in the dash. And I'm like, how is that even usable anymore? Wow. It's like, uh, and they took like an emergency, like one of those safety kits that I had, you know, like a $20 safety kit you get for Christmas that your grandma bought off. Of well, like with a flare yeah. in it. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, I don't, of all the cars in the lot. I mean, this thing was, you know, it had been in a accident and the car was like the back end was like twisted. I'm like, why target this one? Mm -mm. Yeah. They luckily... They didn't take my sleeve of like 24 just banging <laughs> CDs. They left that. Like, how bad oh, is it when man. the thief starts like going through your CDs and they're yeah. just like, nah, leave them. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. All right. Well, before we move on to in case you missed it, we have another word from our new sponsor, Red Zone. Manufacturers are facing extraordinary challenges today. With labor shortages, supply chain disruptions, and a changing workforce, complex industrial technology doesn't cut it on the front line. What's needed is a new way of working that will not only meet throughput goals, but change the shop floor culture to one of winning, where every worker feels they play a part in achieving the company's goals for success. What's needed is Red Zone, the connected workforce solution. And we're back. And before we get rolling with In Case You Missed It, just remember that Red Zone has big clients, particularly in food and beverage and the consumer packaged goods industry. Red Zone, empower the front line, grow the bottom line. All right. Let's move on to In Case You Missed It. The stories that, you know, maybe weren't as popular on our websites this week, but still stand to make a big impact on the industry going forward. Anna, what was your In Case You Missed It this week? Mm, you sure you want to start with me? I can start. All right. Uh, oh, I thought you were oh, telling me to go. I was sorry, like, yeah. no, 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 you start. That's good. All right. Jeff? No. <laughs> go ahead, Anna. Uh, so the story I selected is about GM. So we're just kind of keeping with that automotive thread today. But they're doing a lot of interesting stuff and saying a lot of interesting stuff. So General Motors will keep its headquarters in its seven-building office tower complex in downtown Detroit, its CEO says. Mary Barra, in an interview with the Associated Press, said that GM's main office will remain in the Renaissance Center, the centerpiece of the city's skyline, just across the Detroit River from Canada. Quote, our headquarters will always be in Detroit, in the Renaissance, she said. Uh, that's our home. Then Barra went on to qualify her remarks by saying she can't predict what will happen in 5, 10, or 15 years. So, the headquarters will always be in Detroit <laughs> unless well, in, four years. <laughs> in, in, yeah, in five years, something changes. Um, and I just, it, when I read that, I was just like, man, I don't, <laughs> it's like this kind of offhand communication that we get from top executives making definitive statements that apply for only this Very second nice. that like, I don't know. I just I like she was speaking more like, I don't know. Our home will always be here. Like, I don't know, without their headquarters. Our being headquarters there. will always be in Detroit in, oh, headquarters. Okay. in the Renson, yeah. right. she see. said. Mm -hmm. No, it's, that's our home. It's uh, I'm constantly surprised because the other thing is like, you can just say that. And then if something changes in five years and they're like, whoa, whoa, five years ago, you said it's like, hey, the market shifted. You know, you don't have to like qualify everything with like, hey, as long as everything stays cool, we're going to be here. I know. I just like, you know, it's like you, you wonder why people have whiplash, like following these markets. I mean, like to me, it was like, this is Ford taking a hundred million dollars from the state of Michigan to create jobs and then turning around like within a month and cutting up thousands of jobs or like, Amy's being so buried in business that they open up a new plant and then they close it down within a year or Tesla saying that they accept Bitcoin. And then, you know, I just read that they've unloaded 75% of their, the Bitcoin yeah. in their coffers. Like 
I just, it just feels indicative of like how quickly things change and how everything that anybody says needs to be taken with a grain of salt. And that's business people. I think like, despite their experience and their pedigrees, like they still don't have a crystal ball. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's become impossible to like take anything that they say at face value. Um, What prompted her to come out with this? She was just, it was an interview. So I don't know exactly like how the question came about, but it was asked, right? Like what the future of GM, you know, will they stay in Detroit? And obviously, you know, what comes out of her speculating to say like, well, we don't know. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, like that was just such a weird statement that didn't make any sense. And it was just, it was an eye roller for me. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Sometimes you get caught in those interviews where you're just like, oh, you know what? I should have stopped the thought there. (laughs) Yeah. So I don't know. It just like you, it's, I don't know. You want to hold these companies accountable for their pledges and their plans and all this stuff. And it just, it's, it's getting harder to do that. It seems like companies like make decisions on a dime anymore and you just don't, you can't expect Mm -hmm. anything. And I don't know. Everyone's going by the Elon Musk playbook now. Just like, you know what? I can just say anything. Yep. And then when something else happens, I'll be like, I don't know. Yeah, sorry. The world, am I right? Yeah, exactly. Like, well, that was true at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. So I guess, I mean, fair enough, but I just found the whole thing to be sort of irritating. It's very frustrating. Um, My In Case You Missed It this week uh, was a story on space factories. And I mean, you guys had to have read this headline and been like, this is going to be David's In Case You Missed It. Um, Space factories are going to build materials, quote, impossible to manufacture on Earth. UK-based startup Spaceforge wants to send a factory into outer space where it can take advantage of extreme conditions to build electronic components, metal alloys, and pharmaceuticals that would be impossible to make here. The company's first Forge Star mission will launch later this year. Spaceforge hopes to produce lighter alloys since there won't be enough gravity to separate the metal into multiple layers, the company also believes that anti-gravity will help the cell with cell growth in biopharmaceutical applications. But the problem is usability. <laughs> Ooh. Spaceboard is building what they call the world's first fully returnable and relaunchable satellite. Now, other companies, inclu- and NASA included, uh, NASA, Amazon, and other companies are in the space-making race. But I mean... First of all, the logistics on these stories where I'm like, that's great. You're making an out of this world component. And I understand that those are going to come at a premium, especially if they are particularly game changing in any given industry. But the logistical challenges of getting it to the space factory, making it successfully, successfully sending it back in a reusable satellite in a condition, let's say like new, where it's still usable, it's, uh, I don't know, I normally, I love I love all these stories. I love the fact that they're trying this and that it's even possible. That is fantastic. But it just seems real unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when the company who's championing their own technology says, eh, I just don't know how to get it there. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that does make you kind of wonder. I mean, it's a cool thought. I mean, the materials that they're talking about, yeah, the, the ramifications, you know, endless in yeah. terms of what they could end up being but yeah if you can't figure out how to transport it yeah it's a problem well, well, it's, and yeah. like like who's gonna make it like you can't even get people to like come into the office right now <laughs> you're gonna get people to work at your space, space factory space factory has no one seen moon i don't think that would be a problem i think yeah. you give people to work in space but you think if you pay them a lot of money you could get people to work in space yeah. I mean, how's that going to work? You can, you can pay factory wages and people are going to go to space? I don't think I so. I feel like there might be some sort of premium. This could be like Armageddon where they're yeah. just like rounding up the best. Uh, well, know. but I mean, like, I feel like that's a fair point because how would you make this economically viable? I think it's fully automated. It just, it, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, come on. It could be, I mean, uh, but agreed, like, uh, And actually, I bet you could pay enough of a premium because obviously these parts that they make in space are going to be crazy. But there's no fully automated factory on Earth. I I just don't see how this. Yeah. It's very speculative. Yeah. Maybe, you know, you got one or two people up there. Good people. You know, you vet them a lot. What I'm concerned not about is them going there or being up there and working. I'm concerned about how they are when they come back. Where it's just like, 
you're just up in space making these incredibly because I mean it's going to need to be like very skilled positions likely mm-hmm. yeah. you know with uh you know both advanced manufacturing and an engineering background because you're probably going to need a like troubleshoot if there's product product development errors um I don't know what I mean, you think, I think you can I think you could find people that would do this I I, yeah. I mean not a ton and obviously it's going to be difficult you <laughs> yeah. have to pay them well and all that I don't think that'd be the problem but yeah, if you can't logistically figure out, I mean, that back. seems like point A. Like that's true. Lots, like the lots first of problems. Thing. We can agree on yeah. that. But. but well, also, if they're talking about the prototype they're going to build to get the products back, if I take that job, I'm just going to need to be a hundred percent on the way they're getting me back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, just like so. I love the job. Thanks. The benefits are going to be great. Going to take care of my family. How do I get home? Oh, you'll get home. That's not <laughs> what. That's not what I was looking for. It's also, uh, to me, just the complete opposite of all this nearshoring and onshoring that we've heard about. Space shoring. Space shoring. And can we just give them a minute for their name, Space Forge? Well done. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Jeff, you're in case you missed it this week. Something a little closer to home. Here on Earth. <laughs> Thank God. We'll talk about uh, truck protest shut down um, operations at the California port in Oakland, actually. So truckers are protesting a state labor law that effectively shut down this port in Oakland. And it comes at a really tough time because, David, it comes as toy makers. No. And other industries are entering their peak season for imports because retailers are looking to stockpile, get ready for the holiday and back to school. They're protesting Assembly Bill 5. This is that gig economy law that we've covered a lot because it was impacting Uber drivers, but it could also reach an impact um, truck drivers as well. It was passed in 2019 and it made it harder for companies to classify workers as independent contractors instead of employees. The thought from the government entity was if they're employees, they're going to be entitled to insurance and a lot of other benefits that come with being an employee. These truck drivers and other gig economy workers are saying, we don't want this. You're actually limiting how much we can make and what we can do. So the truckers were protesting in response to that. I think it's a very interesting development. I think this legislative action came with the best of intentions in trying to help more workers get up to scale, be paid better. But then unions get involved and it becomes a political issue. And it probably wasn't thought out as much as it should, because now they're looking at this potentially impacting as many as 70,000 truckers. Ooh. Now, if there is a group we don't need to piss off right now, it's over the road truckers. OK, we need these guys to be happy and running smoothly. So I, I think it was a little bit short sighted in terms of its reach and what it was attempting to do. And I think we're going to be potentially feeling the impact of truckers not getting on board with this. I think there's some work that needs to be done if they want to move forward with this law. They need to tweak it a bit or they need to get out of the way so these folks can get back to doing what they want to do because most of the people that have been impacted by it have been very vocal in their opposition to it. Yeah. Uh, Anna, do you have any thoughts on the trucker protest? Um, I didn't realize that how it was impacting um, truckers specifically because, like you said, Uber was really – like yeah. Uber drivers were really at the – crux of this, I think, when it was being lobbied and passed, um, because I think a lot of those drivers were like living or making like below poverty wages and not, you know, like there was a lot of people that were fighting for this because they were sort of being exploited, um, in their, in their words. But, um, I think where it started in California was a lot of the agricultural workers were basically mm-hmm. being treated as contractors mm-hmm. as opposed to employees. Exactly. And yeah. they were being split. I agree a hundred percent. And that's where I, th- I think they just lost sight of who this was all impacting. Right. And if you, you know, like, does it need some sort of clause where if you're a contractor that's like making a certain wage and has flexibility because of it, can you opt out or something, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, before we get out of here this week, let's move on to our final thoughts. Um, Anna, what's your final thought this week? Well, um, yesterday I was working from home um, uh, and my seven-year-old daughter was uh, there. And usually on my work from home days, we walk to the library, which is like a block away. And then I work on their Wi-Fi and she like putters around. Mm. And um, (laughs) yesterday she ran into like a bunch of her friends from her first grade class. And it was a very happy and high pitched reunion. And um, then she like was like basically like, mom, stay over here. Do not come near me. Like she ditched me completely at the library. Oh no! And I was like, ah, today is the day. (laughs) Fine. But um, but then she wound up crawling into my bed last night during the night. So I feel like I still got her. Man. But it was like I, I was like trying not to be crushed by it when she was like 
get away from here. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you're so brave and grown up. I know. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm just gonna live in denial that that won't happen. Anymore. I know it's just it's a hard day, but um, I it comes in waves, I guess. So far, I know Jeff, you went through this. Yeah, I can still remember the first time I dropped uh, my oldest daughter off at some sort of school event. She's like, "Park here, <laughs> <laughs> I will walk the rest of the way." So, man, do not under any circumstances make eye contact with me. <laughs> um, my final thought this week is just that. Uh, I finally had my kids who are both under five vaccinated this week. Yeah. And um, and it was like I, you know, just because it was something new and, uh, you know, they've never had a reaction to a vaccine before. But anytime something's new and you're putting in your kid, you get a little uh, squirrely, or at least I do. I'm the, definitely the dad that's asking a thousand questions. Like as they're slowly lowering the needle, it's going to be fine, right? going to be fine. going to be fine, right? Everything's going to be fine. All the studies. Okay. And uh, I just wanted to say that everything was great. There were... Uh, no reactions at all, not even like uh, any sort of aches and pains, anything like Good. that. And uh, the reason I wanted to bring that up as my final thought is because uh, that was like Monday or Tuesday and throughout like softball and other social things that I was doing this week, I was talking to a lot of people that all have kids in the same age range and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I was thinking about it, but just kind of wanted to wait around and like, you know, see how things were going. A lot of people had actually already had exposures and so they kind of had like a, that like 90 day window still that they were within. But I just wanted to say as a final thought, Everything went smooth. It was great. And, uh, you know, if they qualify, encourage people to get it for their kids. As a person that was, you know, apprehensive as like a, the super worried dad. So, um, Jeff, what's your final thought this week? Um, very minor final thought, but Big Timber season two is on Netflix. I would highly recommend it. I love that show. <laughs> Big Timber. So, it's, it's the best. This guy just like lives in a sandbox. He like goes from his truck to his road grader to his bulldozer to his it's just fun to watch him do his thing. But so highly recommend that. Also, just want to get back to trivia. Our question from last week was which of the following sort of natural disasters um, gathered the most reader attention? The options were tornado, wildfire, hurricane, earthquake and volcano. The winner is tornado. Mm. That one is we had uh, a couple different stories. The big one being that uh, facility uh, down in Ohio, right? Or May Mayfield. Mayfield. Yeah. Um, that one as well as there was also an Amazon facility that was also hit by a tornado. So those that was the winner. So congratulations to everybody who got that one right. This week we're going to talk about. We talked about some different product things going on here, um, like the leaf being dropped. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fallen. Um, different um, <laughs> vehicles being stolen, things like that. So it got me thinking a little bit about product recalls. Mm -hmm. So which of the following companies got the most reader attention for recall, a recall or recalls in the last year? Ford, General Motors, Tesla, General Mills, Tyson, or an outlier, Sun Villa. They were the company that had the solar umbrellas that caught oh, on fire. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So again, we've got automotive, we've got food, and then we've got Sun Villa, the outlier. Mm. The options again, which company Got the most reader attention for product recalls in the last year. Ford, General Motors, Tesla, Sun Villa, General Mills, or Tyson. That's Let a me tough one. No. Even yeah. for me, who has access to this information. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Jeff. The leaf did fall and it was raked into the pile of automotive history. Please don't. <laughs> Just end there. <laughs> All right. Well, before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to reach any of us, you can email the podcast. You can email Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. Finally, you can also subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters and make sure you get the podcast delivered to your inbox first. All right, for Jeff and Anna, I'm David Manti. This is the Today in Manufacturing podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast.